Uh, it is good to be with you this morning. If this is your first Sunday uh, or second Sunday, if you were here last week, uh, we're so glad that you're here. If you are part of our, our normal family of Bridgepoint, uh, it is so good to be with you again this morning. Uh, I've missed you guys. And uh, uh, I want to start off by letting you know that today's message is going to be a little more educational, instructional, um, but it's for a purpose. And so um, I'm going to try to keep it interesting and, and uh, keep us on track here um, so if you want to go ahead right now and get to the text that we're going to be in, it'll be a little bit later, but we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles, there is one in the pew. If you don't have it, uh, you can open it up and I will be in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. Um, there is a professor uh, in the state of North Carolina who is a, a college professor who um, makes it a point in his class to, um, for lack of a better term, aims to deconvert Christians. Um, he aims to call into question uh, students' belief and their faith. And so um, it's, it's kind of sad, but it's, um, it's pretty successful um, because he's a smart, um, educated man and very convincing with his, with his arguments. And, and one of the things that he does in his lectures, in his classes, some of the things that he starts out with is, is asking some questions to kind of narrow people into a path of thinking by asking them, at the beginning of this class, it's a religious studies class, and he asks them, how many of you would say that the Bible is the inspired word of God? And most of the students in this class will raise their hand. So then he says, how many of you have read the Harry Potter book series by J.K. Rowling? Or some other popular book series in case you're not into fake wizardry and you think that it's sinful. So if there's another one in there, he'll ask him about that subject and people will raise their hands all over the room because everybody's read Harry Potter everybody's read the Hunger Games and so the next question he asks he asks them how many of you have read the Bible from front to back and very few if any hands in this classroom has been raised and from there he basically springs the trap of what he's getting to with them and he asks this question about their belief and about their faith if you really believed that God wrote a book, wouldn't you want to read it? That's a tough question uh, because I know that I get excited to read the Harry Potter books because my wife loves those books and I love the movies um, and I figure I should meet her in the middle and read these books and I get excited to read it. But I love the Bible more than I love the Harry Potter series, but Am I as excited to read it? And asking that question, even to myself, if I really believe God wrote a book, wouldn't I want to read it? Puts me in a place of thinking and conviction that says, I've got to get that answer solid in my heart, and then I've got to let that answer move me to action. It's a jarring question. And sadly, if we personally are not diligent with our faith, inconsistencies can pop up in us between what we believe and what we live out. We can't talk about how much we love Jesus. We can't talk about how much we love the church. We can't talk about how much we love his word, but spend more time at the gym or spend more time reading celebrity tweets or Facebook statuses or even the news than we do the word. I'm not saying don't read those things. But if we're reading tweets and Facebook and the news more than we're reading the Bible, there's an imbalance there. And that imbalance is an inconsistency that has the power to have a shrink down and feel defeated and be a reminder that our, we are unable in, in to pick God's kingdom over our kingdom. And I think in that classroom, some of those students see that, think about that, and realize, yeah, he's right. And slowly start to back off of what they've always believed and what they've been taught and start to go a different route and start thinking about things in a different way. Inconsistencies will arise on our walk. I mean, that's just the way that it is. Um, and when we, when we talk about the inconsistencies, those things should be a challenge to us rather than something that defeats us. When someone comes to us and says, you know, you talk a big game about church, but I don't see you act like it at work or at home or at school or wherever it is. 
We shouldn't let that defeat us and say, well, if that's the case, then I'm just going to stop trying. That should cause us to jump out and say, you know what? You're right. I'm going to spend more time reading my Bible because this is important to me. And because I believe that God wrote a book, I want to spend time reading it. So it should be a challenge to us to strengthen our faith by reading his word. God's word is his word because he inspired it and presented it to us and preserves it for us. So to answer this question, Professor's question, if you really believe that God wrote a book, wouldn't you want to read it? Our answer this morning has to be, since we believe that God wrote a book, or even since God wrote a book, I will read it. I will trust it. I will study it. And we will preach it. Not just the happy stuff. Not just the things that seem good for us. But the old stuff and the new stuff and the tough stuff and the fun stuff. We want to preach the entire scripture because God inspired this for us and for his glory. Now, I became a Christian when I was 15 years old, 18 years ago. And I, was, I remember I was invited to church by my best friend at the time, Megan Pollard. She said to me at lunch, she's like, hey, you should come to youth group tonight at our church. I mean, I'm not doing anything else. I'll be off my Adderall by then. My life will be up in the highs. I'll be ready to hang out with some people. Um, that's not a joke. That's a true story. Uh, after school, Adam was different than at school, Adam, that's for sure. Um, you can see which one prevailed. Um, uh, but she said, hey, they have free food for the first time you come. And I'm like, thank the Lord for Baptists. And I went. And I never stopped going, man. You feed me two hot dogs and a bag of chips, and I'm there for life. So be careful for inviting us over to dinner uh, at your house, because I may never leave your house. But um, I remember going to church, and I remember the, the youth pastor, Raymond, was talking. And, and I just remember, like, hearing the things about the Bible, and I was like, man, I love this. Like, this is good stuff. I want to read it more. Um, and so I'd go home, and I read this hardback NIV brown Bible that Megan had given me. I don't know where she stole it, out of some hotel room or something, but she gave it to me, and it was mine. Um, and so I would read it all the time, and I loved it. But I had trouble understanding certain things because, one, I was 15, never had spent time in the church, and two, I just wasn't super bright. Um, uh, and I remember sitting reading it, and I was like, man, I want to understand this, I want to understand this. And I remember getting to a place where I was just kind of confused about what was being said. And it was in, it was in Paul's letter, his first letter to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 12. He says, Timothy, you need, to set the believer, you need to set an example for the believers in life, love, faith, and purity. And I remember going, this is it, all right? I can be an example for people by being an example in these areas. And I went through and made like a checklist of how to be an example in life and love and purity and conduct. But I didn't know how to be an example in faith because I really didn't understand what faith meant, nor what it meant to have faith that was a good example to anyone else. So I went to youth one night and I talked with my youth pastor and I said, Raymond, listen, I've been reading this. I don't understand this. And Raymond said, listen, let me explain to you what faith is. And right then he preached the gospel to me. He told me the story of how Jesus came after me and was waiting for me to just surrender my life and my sin over to him. And I said, dude... If that's how I get into being an example for somebody in faith, I want to do that. I grew up the shortest kid in all my classes. In every sports photo, I was the one on the end. It's basically like the participation spot. They're like, here, you play on the basketball team, you can be on the end. Somebody's got to be the short guy, you know. And that was me. And so, like, I always felt kind of left out. I always felt like I was kind of looked down on, literally and figuratively. And I remember reading that thinking, this book here empowers me to be an example to other people, regardless of who I am or what I know or what I don't know. And that night I gave my life to Christ. It was March 15th, 2000. Gave my life to Jesus. I traded my sin for his forgiveness, and I traded my life for his righteousness, and I never looked back. Now, it hasn't been, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I mean, like, honest to goodness, one of, the, one of the benefits of that day is today. Because without that moment of surrendering over to Christ, I wouldn't know any of you. And the reason why I love that is because every one of you is evidence that Christ is in my life and Christ is in your life. So thank you for being a part of my journey with Christ. Like You are evidence of Christ working in my life because I'm here with you this morning. And that's something, listen, I don't take that for granted. I really don't. Like It's a blessing every week that I get to drive here and work with the people that I get to work with and serve the people that I get to serve with. Um, and it's because of that day in March in 2000 I gave my life to Christ. 
Well, I remember, man, I was like on fire. Like I could have shot hell out with a water pistol. Like I was ready to rock and roll, man. I'm going home. I'm reading as much stuff as I can in the Bible, and I'm just reading through. I skipped Song of Solomon, thankfully. That was a good one to skip. Um, uh, and I was reading, and I was just so on fire about it. And I remember one Sunday, I remember I was sitting in the front row uh, of big church is what we called it, big church. And I remember sitting there, and I remember that, that morning our pastor came and sat next to me. Whew, boy, I thought I had arrived. Because like for me, the pastor was like famous. I mean, he, that's our pastor. That's our dude, man. He's the guy. And he's sitting next to me. And so like I'm sweating. And I'm, like, oh, I'm sitting next to him, and he turns to me and he says, hey, what's your name? And I told him, I was like, my name is Adam Long. I just, I just gave my life to Christ recently, and I want you to know I love everything about the Bible. Like, I was giving him my resume of, like, I'm legit because Christ is in my life. And he was like, you love it? I'm like, I love it, man. I love everything about it. And he said, you love everything about it? You know, he knew what I meant, and he knows that I do. But he was just trying to stir on conversation with me. I said, I love everything about it, Pastor. And he goes, what do you love most about it? I said, man, this book here tells me everything I need to know about life. And he was like, man, everything? I said, absolutely, Pastor. I said, there's a chapter in this Bible that tells me how to get a job. I said, that's amazing. Now, I haven't read it yet because I'm only 15 and I don't need to work. And my pastor kind of looked at me with like a puzzled but intrigued look on his face. And he was like, there's, there's a chapter that tells you how to get a job? I, oh, yeah, pastor. I said, it's in there. I saw it. It's the book of job. And I said, um, um, and I said like, I, like I told you before, I hadn't read it yet because I'm only 15. And he laughs, right? And, uh, and it wasn't just like a chuckle. It was like a belly laugh. And he like, you know, leaned back. And he was like, Adam, he said, uh, I think you're talking about the book of Job, not job. <laughs> To which, uh, with all the confidence in the world, laughed. I said, <laughs> Pastor, listen, uh, I'm new to this Bible thing, but I'm not new to reading. And I know J-O-B <laughs> is Job and not Job. I'm sure you can fill in how that story ends. Um, uh, but, man, like, I loved the Bible. And I love it still. Like, I still love it, okay? It's the thing that I do the most. Like, I, I read the Bible for a job, like what a job that I have, it's amazing, um, and, I, and I love it, and, and in my Bible, there's a, there's a quote here, uh, you can tell how much I love it, my Bible looks like it's been through it, um, there's a quote I wrote down in my Bible somewhere, I don't know when I read it, uh, or when I heard it, and it's kind of faded because I wrote it in pencil, but it says, I cannot know God more than I know his word, I cannot love God more than I love his his word. And listen, over the years, I've come to find out just how true that statement really is. And so this morning, I would really like to take a question that was crafted to be a trap and turn it into a motivating question that stirs our hearts for the rest of this morning and pushes us into the next three weeks while we're spending time in Habakkuk. If we really believe God wrote a book, wouldn't we want to read it? If we believe that God really wrote a book, wouldn't we want to trust it? If we believe that God really wrote a book, wouldn't we want to study it? And as a church, if we believe that God really wrote a book, wouldn't we want to preach it? If I can answer for all of us this morning, I would say the answer to those four questions is a resounding yes. Absolutely yes. I want you to know this morning you can read his word. You can trust his word. You can study his word. And we can preach his word as a church because it is his word that we have been given. If you join me in Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 14. We're going to have the words on the screen. You've got your Bible uh, in the pews. I'm going to read it as well. But Timothy... 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 14, it says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Verse 1, it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, 
and by his appearing in his kingdom preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. I truly believe that Paul is instructing Timothy to answer that question from the professor by saying, since God wrote a book, it must be preached. Since the Bible is the inspired word of God, it must be preached. And if we work backwards from there, for something to be preached, it must be studied. And for something to be studied, it must be trusted. And for something to be trusted, it must be read. And so what I want to do this morning is I just want to walk through this text together. Um, And we're going to take a 30,000 foot view of it. All right, we're just going to do a flyby and just kind of take a look at this together um, and get the overall picture of what Paul is talking about here to kind of push us in the direction we want to be in this over the next month. He says, but as for you, speaking directly to Timothy, this is a letter to Timothy who is a pastor being mentored by Paul. Paul urges him, he says, continue That's present tense. Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. He says, continue progressing in what you have learned, in the things that have been taught to you. Continue progressing in what you firmly believe, the things that you've been convicted of. And and continue on in the things that you know, the things that you now understand He says, continue progressing in these things and remember from whom you learned it and how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. There's a theologian, Augustine, uh, who once said, the holy scriptures are our letters from home. If we were to look back at the introduction of this letter that Paul writes to Timothy, he reminds Timothy that in your childhood, it was your mother And your grandmother who taught you the word, who brought the Old Testament into your life, who taught you the stories of Jesus and brought you into a place where you were able to give your faith to Jesus. It's in chapter 1, verse 5. He talks about his grandmother and mother who taught him the things that he now firmly believes and knows about the Bible, which Paul calls the sacred writings Paul continues to say these things. These sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation. Within the word of God is the power to convert sinners into saints. To convert those that are lost to be found. To convert those that are far off from God into new life with Jesus Christ. In the power of the word, it's there. The same voice that created the heavens and the earth, the same voice that made everything in Genesis, that created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. The Bible says ex nihilo. That means there was nothing to start with and what was made was made. The same voice that created everything from nothing is the one who spoke this word into being for us to spend time in this morning. It's amazing. And this word, Paul continues, says, is profitable for teaching in times like this, in big settings, in times like life groups, when you're doing life together, in times of accountability when two men are talking about God together or two women are talking about God together or a husband and a wife are talking about God together. Here's, this is for free. If you're a husband and you're a wife and you're not talking about the gospel together, that's something to do. <laughs> That's a good thing to do. You want to strengthen your marriage? Forget the cruises. Forget the vacations. Forget the spray-on tans. Spend some time reading the Bible, preaching the word to one another, praying for one another, and having this intimate relationship based around the word, and then you can go get a spray tan together. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, thank you. It's a woman who likes a good spray tan. I can appreciate that. Paul says the word is profitable for teaching. It's profitable for reproof, which is the conviction of sins. That when we read this word, it should stir in us to say, there's got to be something that changes in my life because I know that this is here. If you read the word and it doesn't stir you to move closer to Christ or change things that are not Christ-like in your life, then we're not reading it right. For reproof, 
for correction. This is the purpose of restoration. Listen, there are going to be people in your lives who wrong you or wrong your small group or your church or what you believe. There will be people who hurt you. And that's an understandable season that you will go through in your life. But the word is made here. It says it is profitable for correction. Correction does not not end with you have done wrong. I need you to step out of my life for a time period. That's not where the word ends. It may start there. Matthew 18 says you have to confront sin. But over time, at a time, at the right time, there is restoration that says this is where we've been and this is where we need to be. So the Bible is profitable for restoration. Yeah. And listen, that's a big one for me uh, because I've put myself in too many places of needing to be restored among people. So for me, I'm so thankful that the word is restorative because there's been times where I've been at a place where it's like I'm unworthy of friendship. I'm unworthy of the word. And the word says to me, no, you are worth Christ. And that's what restoration is about. He says, and it's also profitable for training in righteousness. The word is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, all for the purpose That we would be made righteous before God. That our standing before God would be innocent because we are standing with Christ. It's all towards this effort. That the man of God may be competent for every good work. Competent and equipped for every good work. Not perfect. Not arrived. But competent and equipped to trust the Lord for every good work. So again... Since we know that God wrote a book, shouldn't we read it? Since God wrote a book, shouldn't we study it? And since God wrote a book, shouldn't we trust it? And likewise, as a church, since God wrote a book, shouldn't we preach it? Paul seamlessly moves from the inspiration of Scripture to the proclamation of Scripture. It's seamless. He says that this word is in the inspired word of God. Timothy, you got to preach it. This is a one-two punch. This is a cause and effect. This is a natural progression. God inspired the word so that man could preach the word. Since God's word is his inspired word, we will read it. We will trust it. We will study it. And we will preach it. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Because Jesus is exactly who he says he is and has done exactly what he says he has done, preach the word about Jesus Christ. And Paul says to Timothy, be ready in season and out of season. When things are going well for you and when things are going in the gutter for you, be ready to preach. It says, in season and out of season, be ready to reprove, to rebuke, to call sin, sin, but also to exhort, to acknowledge growth in people's life, to do life together with complete patience and teaching. This morning, I, my aim right now is for us to fall deeply in love with the Word of God. And I know it would be natural to think, like, hey, we're already here. Like, we're the ones that are already on board. It's the ones out there that, that aren't on board. But I'm glad that we didn't have a, a, a clipboard at the front that when you came in said, how many times did you read your Bible this week? Because that's not a clipboard that I would want to write my name on it. And I'm the one standing up here preaching. (laughs) So I'm not sure many of us would want that there. So as much as the people outside of this building do need to have a deep love for the word, I want us in this building to have a deep love for his word. So I have four things here for us. Um, And we've said them numerous times. So we're going to say them again. Because anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Um, I learned that somewhere in seminary, I think. Um, So first thing, we are able to read his word because he gave us his word. We are able to read his word because he gave us his word. Verse 16 says, all scripture is God-breathed, all of it. 
This proves its divine origin and its eternal authority. God always gives us his best. Always. From the very beginning, God gave us his best. And in this word, he has given us his best for us to train and be trained in it because it is profitable. Maybe you had a parent or a grandparent that was really dedicated to reading the word. And that's given you this desire to want to read the word more. And, and we want to move in that direction of reading the word. Because after Christ defeated sin, arose from the grave, and ascended into heaven, the love letter that God left for us with his Holy Spirit is the word of God. This is what we have now. And the people in the Bible tell us, you have it so much better than we had it. Yes, we walked with Christ, but you have the whole story of Christ. Oftentimes, we make the mistake of saying, if Jesus was here, it would be so much easier for me to walk with him. If Jesus would just tell me what he wants me to do, it would be so much easier for me to listen to him. He's already said what he needs to say. He's already here walking with us. You carry him with you in your heart, but also in your cell phone, because you can find the Bible, in so many different ways. And I would say, if Christ was here telling me what to say, I guarantee there'd be days where I'd go, are you sure? Are you sure you want me to do that? I don't really think that's what you want me to do. And so we make this mistake of thinking, if it was here, we would have it. But the writers of the New Testament say, if you're reading this, you have it better than we have it because you've got the whole picture. We just had one float on the parade. You've got the whole shebang. And so because we have that, Let's read it. Let's read it. Second thing this morning, we are able to trust his word because God used his word to lead us to Christ. This is verses 14 and 15. He says to Timothy, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. It was Paul's, I mean, Timothy's mother and grandmother who stirred the affections of the word in his heart to lead him to a place where he gave his life over to Christ and is now living his life in a way that he is preaching the word to people in his city and in his town. Maybe you came to know the Lord because of a parent or grandparent or family member. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher that, that helped lead you to the Lord. Maybe it was like me, a friend who was pouring the word into you and being an inviter to the gospel that led you to that. Whatever it may be, it's a guarantee that the word that is inspired from God leads to life change. It leads to life change. And because the word of God changes lives, let's trust it. Thirdly, we are able to study his word because it is divinely inspired by God. Yes, there are men attached to these writings. And there are men and women over the decades who have helped translate this from Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic into English. There have been so many people that have been a part of getting this from there to hear, but it all began with the inspiration of God to these men. None of these men could write any of these words without God first impressing on them what he wanted them to write. That's why we read the Bible with authorial intent. That's why I will not sit in a group of people and say, hey, what do you think this means? What did this mean to you? I don't care what it means to you. I don't care what it means to me. What it means is what God means it to say. And the question I should be asking is, now that we know what God means by this, how is this going to change my life? That's what it is. It's inspired by him. And we're able to study it because it's divinely inspired by him. If it wasn't inspired by God, if it was just men writing these 66 books based on what they wanted, if that was the case, it wouldn't be trustworthy. It wouldn't be trustworthy because we're flawed. We're imperfect people. But only a perfect God that inspires his perfect, infallible, inerrant word is trustworthy. So since we know that he is the one who inspired it, because we see here all scripture is breathed out by God, we can trust his word. And it should lead us to study it. 
this word here, Paul basically makes up a word where it says all scripture is breathed out by God. Breathed out scripture is all one word where he takes the Greek word for for God and breathed and kind of morphs them into one word. It's the only place in scripture that we see that word. But it's basically the breath of God is what we spend time reading. We were worth the word of God. We were worth the breath of God. That he would give this to us and preserve it so that we could be here this morning and spend time reading it, trusting it, and studying it. And lastly, collectively, as the church, we are called to preach his word. And we're able to preach his word because God calls us in his word to be matured. Verse 16, it says, all scriptures breathe out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. God uses the word of his voice to mature us. Now, we're all on different scales of maturity when it comes to the word, and that's how family should be. We can't all be on the same level, because if we're all on the same level, we have no one to bring up with us and no one to bring us up with them. So we do this life together because we are growing together in maturity. God's word is profitable, and that the man of God would be equipped with it. The preaching of his word brings God glory. And it brings life change to women and men that God has sought out. So Paul charges Timothy here, preach the word. So let's be a church that preaches the word. Now you might be asking, what does this have to do with Habakkuk? I thought thought you said at Easter that we were talking about Habakkuk. And now you're in a Timothy. Like, are you lying? Because I think that's one of the things that we need to avoid here. Well, I'm so glad that you asked. I could just see it. I could see you salivating to talk about Habakkuk and, and say it because it's fun to say. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you asked. As a church, over the last six months, we've spent time in Romans 6, 7, and 8, which those are powerhouse books. Those are, those are big-time books. We spent some time in those. And we spent time in Colossians as well, the entire book. We walked through the entire New Testament book of Colossians. And the New Testament is amazing. It is amazing. Like it is, it is the go-to for me when I want to read something. I read the New Testament because it's talking about Jesus. But the Old Testament is equally as important to our growth and understanding of the Bible that it demands us to read it so that we can trust it and we can study it and also so that we can preach it. So this morning is my attempt to give us all a foundational understanding of the inspiration of Scripture because I truly believe that we can only love God as much as we love His Word. And we can only know God as much as we know His word. As I said earlier this morning, my aim was to help us fall deeply in love with God's word because it comes directly from God. And it brings us back to God. The best way I have come to understand the process of growing deeper in my love for the Bible is spending time in the Bible. The New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Only then will I get the the, the full picture of Scripture and truly develop a love and dependence on the Word. Now that being said, what is the full picture of the Bible? Like if someone said to you, hey, what's a theme of the Bible? What is that thing all about? There's one thread that runs through it. What is it? The Bible declares its main message right after the dawn of human history. After God made all things good Everything went to bad as a consequence of sin that entered the world through man. And in order for everything to be made right again, God designed a plan to rescue humanity, the broken world, from its sinful corruption. The theme of the entire scripture scripture, is that Jesus was the plan from day one. 
That Jesus is the plan that God devised for man. I want you to know that Jesus was not plan B. Jesus was not the, oops, I didn't see that happening. Jesus was the plan before anything was created out of nothing in Genesis 1. Before you get to, in the beginning, Jesus was the plan. From the beginning, God said, I'm going to create man, and they're going to go astray, but I've got to do something to bring them back. It's going to be you, in human form, going down after them and bringing them back to us. Are you in? Yes. Holy Spirit, part of me, you're going to go after him, and you're going to live among them and teach them and be with them. Are you okay with that? Yes. Then he said, all right, I'm going to start creating. And from nothing, he began to mold and make the earth that we now live on. Jesus was not a plan B. He was plan A from the start. That is the theme of the Bible. It's it's no coincidence that the time we spent in the book of Colossians as a church, our series title was Jesus is Enough. No coincidence. It's no coincidence that last Sunday we were in Hebrews at Easter And we talked about the theme of Hebrews as a whole is that Jesus is greater. It's no coincidence that these two books have very similar things. It's because that is the theme. Jesus is the theme. And listen, I don't know if you get tired of hearing me talk about Jesus or saying the name of Jesus, because I say it a lot. But I want you to know, I will never get tired of saying the name of Jesus. And as a church, we will never stop preaching the name of Jesus. So I hope you're excited about it, because we're going to be doing it a lot. Because it is in the name of Jesus that we are here. So the entire theme of the Bible is that Jesus was sent in order to bring God glory and redeem humanity. So by that logic, every book of the Bible points to Jesus as the God-glorifying, humanity-redeeming Savior, even Habakkuk. Even a three-chapter book slammed in the middle of the Old Testament somewhere points to Jesus Christ. Truth be told, the entire Bible can be broken down into about ten sections, as well as about five parallel sections. And what I want to do this morning is I want to give you these five sections this morning and kind of use this to propel us to the the end of our time together this morning and into the next three Sundays together. We've got them on the screen, so if you want to take a picture of it, write it down, uh, commit it to memory, we'll have them here. So every part of our Bible points to the theme of Jesus. The Old Testament, Jesus is predicted He is predicted throughout the entire Old Testament. In the Gospels, the good news, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is revealed. It is when Jesus steps to the the playing field of earth and says, all that stuff they've been talking about for years, I'm here. I'm here. The book of Acts is a picture of Jesus being preached. This is the moment after he ascends back into heaven and his boys go out and preach the gospel, and bring the church up. They planted churches. And so Jesus is preached in the epistles. Weird word. What that is, it's, it's the pastoral letters from Paul and Hebrews and things like Philemon and First and Second John and Third John and First Peter and Second Peter. The letters in the epistles, Jesus is explained These are men who are saying, everything that you've learned and seen and taught, this is what it means. And finally, the revelation, the last book we have in our our Bibles, Jesus is expected. Because everything that we've read so far, we've seen the prediction of Christ, we've seen the, the revealing of Christ, we've seen the preaching of Christ, we've seen that explained, and now we are in a place where we are preaching and we are expecting because one day he will come back and he will get us and he will take us home. And so when we look at scripture, everything points to Christ, and these are the themes and the subplots of what these books are about. So, by nature, being an Old Testament book, Habakkuk is a book that has predicted. Jesus. Habakkuk has been called the prophet with a problem. And we'll get more into that a little bit later on. But because this book is a, is a record of a, of a man complaining to God 
about how God is handling wickedness in the area of Israel at the time. Habakkuk is a recording of this interaction between a, a man complaining about how God is doing what he is doing or, or what maybe he isn't doing. The theme of the entire Bible is that Jesus is the God-glorifying, humanity-redeeming Savior. And based on that text, the theme of Habakkuk is trust the Lord no matter what. That's the theme of Habakkuk. Trust the Lord no matter what. And if we put a subtitle to that is because Jesus is enough, because Jesus is greater, because Jesus is the plan, because Jesus, period. Because in his name is the power to change lives. Knowing this allows us to read small books in the Old Testament and see the grand narrative of the Bible. This whole morning has been in an effort to preach a love letter about the love letter that God wrote to us, his word. So over the next three weeks, we're going to take a deep look into a small book of Habakkuk with the expectation of growing deeper in our love for his word. Now, I think that we would miss a golden opportunity this morning to put into practice what we say. Um, The whole Bible points to the gospel that Jesus is the God-glorifying, humanity-redeeming Savior. And for some of you, that means a lot. Because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for some of you, it doesn't mean very much because you don't have that personal interaction with Christ. And I want you to know that this whole book is written about Jesus and everything that he did, first, to glorify his Father, and second, to bring us home. And I want you to know that Jesus has called us to surrender our life to him, And surrender our sin over to him. And for our sin, he offers us forgiveness. And for our life, he gives us new life. And he gives us a righteousness of his own. And so this morning, if you're not a believer, we want you to know this church's mission is to connect people who are far from Jesus, who are far from God, to a new life in Christ. And the way that happens is by the inspired word of God by allowing the word to change your life, by surrendering over your sin and surrendering over your life. And so if this morning you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to make that an option for you right now. Like you have the ability to say right now, I'm done with that, I'm moving forward with this relationship. John three sixteen and 17 says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That the world might be saved through him. Jesus did not come here to tell you how bad you are. He came here to tell us how good our God is. And so this morning, if you've never experienced that goodness, it's right there for you. We're going to have people up front that are going to be available. Available to pray with you, available to talk with you, available to set up a meeting with you another day during the week to talk more about these things. So if there's something that's stirring on your heart, if you say, I I need to be baptized, I need to get saved, I need to know more about baptism or more about a relationship with Christ, or I just need prayer because of this, This altar is going to be open. You can pray on your own. You can come talk to one of the care team or myself will be up here. So we're just going to worship during this last song. And we're going to pray and we're going to spend time together. And then we're going to transition into a time of communion together. So if you would, let's just go to the Lord in prayer uh, together right now. God, we thank you so much that you sent Jesus Christ. Not to condemn this world, but to save and redeem this world. And so, Father, this morning we pray if there'd be anybody in this room this morning that doesn't have a relationship with you, that doesn't have a deep understanding of what it means to be a believer and a follower of Christ, would you call them to you this morning? Father, we pray that you would give us a deep love for your word. 
we thank you so much that you saw it fit to speak your words into men so that they could record them for us and that we could be here this morning to preach this word, that we could study this word, that we are able to trust this word and read this word. May we do that well this morning, Father. We love you so very much and we pray this in the sufficient and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand and sing and come if you need?